This lecture introduces tall buildings. It is one of the high rise issues series in the sustainable tall buildings degree at the University of Nottingham. The podcast is for private academic use by students and not for broadcast or commercial use of any other kind without permission. The podcast is not a full lecture. It is a quick breeze through the essential ideas in the slides to help students with revision using the PDFs of the original lecture. Other people can apply to the author for copies. Here is the copyright notice. This lecture is the first of the whole lecture course, so Achieve's main things are introducing the tall building typology, and yes, it is a typology, demonstrating how local characteristics and challenges, qualities can become drivers, and introducing, therefore, climatic design concepts, the relationship between climate, built form, construction, lifestyle, and sustainability and reasons why we can't just turn up the aircon and not worry about the future. This amusing photograph, if it is, sums up what a tall building is about. It holds a large number of people on a small footprint. But unlike this one, it cannot move. Sight and context are extremely important. The story behind this is one of urbanisation, that poor people and rural people always want to move to the big city in the hope of better jobs. What do we mean by a tall building? We almost always know what we think when we see one, but technically there are variations. The Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, CTBUH, have three main definitions, one of which is height relative to context. You can see here the smaller buildings are undoubtedly tall if they were in Europe, but in Chicago there are a few which are much taller than their neighbours. Secondly, there is proportion. The slenderness ratio. For example, the Mercantile Mart in Chicago is tall by any standard of height, but it is vastly wider and it is penetrated by light wells and has a huge population. Also, the Pompidou Centre is a tall building because it is much higher than all of its surroundings in Paris, and it certainly employs a lot of technology. Which brings us on to the next definition, employment of tall building technology, such as elevators, mechanical services, and a braced frame. The Leadenhall Tower has almost minor core Structurally, it is mostly composed of a, a very large lattice frame. And of course, the Lloyds of London is only too keen to show you its services on the outside. And both of these are by Rogers Sturk Harbour. Moving on, there are other considerations, which is one of which is the relationship to its space around and the street. Since 1915, New York has had the zoning system, which is about getting daylight into the street below. This still applies now. These are the current New York regulations for daylight into the street, which has produced some interesting building shapes. For example, the boot tower, or in the case of the top left, the cascading curving building, of which there are several examples now in North America. 
you can see here that absolute height is also important. In this diagram, the shortest building is 400 meters plus, and the CTBOH does its best to catalogue tall buildings. And now there are stepping heights, 100, 200, 300, and 400, etc. Also, there is the question of what do you mean by the top? Do you mean the absolute highest radio tower or, or spire? Or do you mean the highest practical occupied floor? So that it is a building containing people or that it is some sort of structure like a radio tower. So it moves us on to function between an observation tower, radio tower, or a building with hotels and offices, etc. There is another question about function. Newer tall buildings tend to be mixed use. And the first example of this was the Hancock Centre, of which one will say more. The last year has been fantastic for the number of tall buildings completed, the number of buildings which are greater than 300 metres. The Shanghai Tower is the highest of the, the year, just finishing off in 2016. <clears throat> Here are some of the great tall buildings of 2015. Shanghai Tower 432 Park Avenue, the pencil tower that is smaller than the Empire State, but has completely the same section and window size all the way up. And I must say, I don't like it. There are some other towers, especially the ones in China, which are making the grade on height. Moving on for awards to tall building designers. It does not necessarily have to be height, but the Via 57 West is a, another shape containing hundreds of apartments by BIG in New York. Of course, the Shanghai Tower by Gensler and two more buildings in the Mediterranean, which are not tall by Chicago standards, but are certainly classified as prize-winning tall buildings. So, recent tall building trends. First of all, height. Sorry. Height. The height has increased hyperbolically in the last 15 years, since the turn of the century. Starting with 1884, the construction of the home insurance, at which time 10 stories was the tallest in the world. We are now seeing 800 metres plus, and a building is underway in Jeddah, which will be 1,000 metres. This is the increase. There was a, a sort of levelling off around the turn of the century, but it is moving upwards again. These are buildings which are constructed or due to be constructed. The Jeddah Tower will be a thousand meters. The number of buildings tall of this height is a sort of rising hockey stick. If we take 200 meters as the standard, the number in the last decade is greater than all of previous history. Look where they all are. Apart from a few individuals, the majority of these are in China. So we see here, Asia is three quarters of all the new tall buildings above 200 meters. 
Europe is about a sixteenth, North America an even smaller fraction of that. The bar chart shows history since 1930. Looking at the number of tall buildings in cities, we can see that Hong Kong vastly outranks all other cities, even New York and Tokyo, in the sheer number above 100 metres. So this is confirming that in 2015, the location of the newest 200 meter buildings are definitely in China and a few in Indonesia and UAE. There is a huge change in function that mixed use are more than a quarter of all new buildings of that height. There is also a corresponding change in materials. It's impractical to use concrete for long span in offices, so the preferred structure is steel. But it is impractical to use steel for residential because you spend a lot of money on partitions which could be load bearing. So a building like the London Shard uses concrete in the basement levels, steel for the office levels, concrete for the apartments and the hotel, and steel for all the upper parts, the visitors gallery and the engineering. Another change has been motivation and title. Until the turn of the century, most tall buildings were representative of corporations even if they were private investments like the Chrysler or the Woolworth. Since the turn of the century, the great tall buildings tend to be named after their country or their city, like the London Shard, Taipei 101, Shanghai Tower, Burj Khalifa, which started off as Burj Dubai. Certainly, these are no longer simply extrusions of floors. The combination of prestige in shape making, computer design and mixed use has meant that, and height, has meant that buildings are no longer just an extrusion of floor plate. Aesthetics are the big change now. Architects are able to do things which could not be even dreamt of previously, either because they can do it with computers or because they are just more imaginative and wanting to keep moving all the time. This building in Bangkok, the Maha Nakhon, is quite a remarkably imaginative piece of work it doesn't even look as if it can stand up because of the apparent erosion in a helical pattern where the building form has been carved into terraces. There are four main drivers for tall buildings. Of course, the first one is land value. They are extremely expensive to build and whatever the idealistic idea behind them, they must be economically returning. Otherwise, who would provide the finance? So if you thought that form followed function, you were wrong, because in the case of tall buildings, form follows finance, a term first derived by Carol Willis, the writer and curator of Skyscraper Museum. Of course, other parameters apply too, such as transport and the economic climate of the whole city, because in a city, a single building is just a component of the economic 
machine. Another factor is global iconic prestige. These buildings are never going to be economic to build or to operate, but if there are a few like the London Shard or the Burj Khalifa, then they give identity to the city. We can see how many of the very tall buildings are all memorable because they almost symbolize their city. One World Trade Center in New York, the Mecca Royal Clock Tower, and so on. The third main driver is population explosion, but more so, even in countries which are controlling population, there is urbanization, where something like 200,000 new dwellers are added to cities every day because people are moving to cities to find work, somewhere better to live. And of course, food manufacturing is improving with more machinery requiring less hand labor to make. In this definition, one should mention that it isn't just the single skyscrapers that matter. We should consider the thousands of functional, useful buildings that are built for housing and working, which don't make it in the record books, but make the city work. The final of these four drivers is sustainability. Of course, we think that tall buildings will be great consumers of energy, and when you cluster them together, they will cause urban heat island effect and congestion. And that is true, of course. But they are necessary for economic and social reasons. And we must conserve the land around our cities for agriculture. So we can make these tall buildings contribute more by energy generation and reducing their CO2 emissions, maintaining urban ventilation, capturing their own water and connecting together with transport. Let's move on to aesthetics and symbolism. One of the movements in Asia is to try and find a symbolic identity and both the Taipei 101 and the Jin Mao are assumed to be adopting or recognizing the form of pagoda and also the form of bamboo, which is a very sound structural concept. And of course, the architects, certainly for Taipei 101, have said exactly that. Also, there are other almost literal references here, such as the Bangkok building, which represents technology, the waving grassy forms of this building for Singapore, or the World Financial Center in Shanghai, looking like a blacksmith created samurai sword. The Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur are famous for having their geometry of their floor plan intersecting forms, squares and circles to reflect Islamic decoration, even though these are by an American architect. The Nat West is notorious for having as its plan the logo of the bank. This building in San Francisco resembles nothing more than a 1950s jukebox and is a piece of fun. There are also problems with buildings which 
either do respond to climate change and energy or try to. This building in the Bahrain World Trade Center is designed as a, an exhibition piece of wind generating and it does work, although not as efficiently as the architects hoped. The whole form of the building is distorted in order to maximize the engineering performance by having a wing shape with the largest wings lower down where the wind speed is lower and the smallest amount of building at the top where the wind speed is naturally a bit higher. It does work, but it is a very expensive solution. This plan also demonstrates how difficult it is to have something like this at eye level, where employers should not be able to see it without risk of being distracted or even having epilepsy, but also it is not ideal to put a vibrating turbine at the midpoint of a bridge where you could get resonant vibration. The floor plan is very inefficient with two cores. This building is more successful, the Pearl River Tower, where the whole building shape has been reshaped in order to direct wind through nozzles with turbines at those points. This building in London, the Strata Tower, it does work as a piece of engineering. The whole building has been shaped to make this possible, but the major error was to put the most expensive apartments at the top so that people would not be prepared to pay millions for an apartment and then have to hear the humming and vibration just above their apartment. So what about this building? Is this a wind turbine? This is an unbuilt project, but it is highly deceptive because it is actually a nightclub that looks like a wind turbine from a distance. This building is interesting. It is in Linz in Austria. It is effectively a large solar panel. The facade consists of solar panels which store thermal energy in seven kilometers of underground pipes, which can be retrieved in the winter using heat pumps. So this is a green building. Let's think about the opportunities for high-rise design. This design for Mumbai was an attempt by students to replicate something of the street life, the markets, the opportunities for green planting at height that they would find in the streets below. This project is also for Mumbai. Is there any way in which this is more suitable to Mumbai? Because it is clearly just a great big prestige, beautiful geometric spike, but not socially contributing. This building in Chicago is residential tower. And although its plan is rather ordinary and rectangular, it has been made extremely interesting by Jeannie Gang with variable balconies for the apartments to give the appearance that the building has an undulating elevation. And by the way, it sits on a large podium of a, a park, leisure park, um, business and fitness suites, underground uh, parking in the podium and lower level houses. This Arcos building in Fukuoka is a very interesting idea in a city which lacks public park space. The city with its cultural center have the opportunity to turn down 
maximizing economic return by providing a fully accessible green public park in the city. This is a design by Jeannie Gang again, where the facade is organized in relation to solar angles to allow solar gain in the winter, but to prevent solar gain in the summer in a residential tower. So, talking about solar gain, we have to consider shading strategies. This interesting building, the National Commercial Bank of Jeddah, is in an extremely hot climate, Jeddah, and the offices all face into a central atrium, which is ventilated with fresh air, and the building turns its back on the prevailing solar angle. The elevator tower is outside the triangle and the staircases are at the ends of the office. Some of the offices are internal but we assume that they have glass partitions. This is the concept, a central core rectilinear building. Cut down the centre Push, down the, push out the core, rotate it to create nice interiors like this with a stack effect of air rising through and there is a banking hall at the base. This is a building by our students for Abu Dhabi 2009. The idea being to create a shady public space using the mashrabia concept of walling where fresh air can go through. There's no need for full glazing. This idea for Singapore by our students in 2009 is trying to recreate the land surface above with a building that has a green forest. As you can see on a massive plat, pl plate, sorry, plateau with, a, with water, water park with some primary forest species and stack effect to the centre of the building for fresh air to rise. This is a real building by Paul Rudolph where he is strongly influenced by traditional Malay architecture where fresh air can be underneath the building and come in through the roof space with good overshading of the roof and the building apartments are overshading each other in a similar way. These drawings, by the way, by Paul Rudolph are remarkable because he drew his drawings with a pen, not with a computer. This is real old school hatching and draftsmanship. And of course, it is extremely difficult to draw a tall building without a computer because of the perspective. There isn't any perspective as the building goes upwards. Ken Yang is one of, one of the most influential thinkers and writers about climate and tall buildings with his books such as The Biochromatic Skyscraper. Climate, for me, is the starting point. Climate, culture and context have to be worked together with a good concept. Let's look at the concepts, functions. What is this building? It doesn't seem to have very much glazing. It has a contained flat roof. Puzzle. Well, I'll have to give the answer. It's a prison. It's in Chicago. You can look down on it from the observation decks of the Willis Tower. What about this one? I'll give you a clue. It's in Japan. Well, the answer here is that you don't want to have to put your children onto school buses or tram 
you want to be able to take them somewhere within the city. So these are schools. The one on the left has three schools. Social spaces, teaching spaces are all arranged around the core. What about this one? This is, in fact, the major courts of justice in Manchester. The glass you see there is the a very high public space with galleried landings which lead you into courts where there is a huge effort made on natural cooling by natural ventilation and by drawing water from underground rivers to cool the building. What about these buildings? Guess what these are? I'll have to tell you, the top right is actually, I don't know what it is. It is just coated in bamboo because in Hong Kong, they still use bamboo as scaffolding. The top left is a hotel in Hebei. The bottom left, what can that be? It is actually an apartment building in Milan. Although this is the rendering, it has actually been built looking very like this, using small trees lifted up into planting boxes on the balconies. This tower in Singapore, designed by one of our students, was second place in the 2014 CTBOH competition. It is a vertical farm in a city with a very strong food culture. It also incorporates fisheries and fish smoking features and also contains residential apartments. And below it are markets and retail spaces and a, re a railway station. It is also scalable technology. There can be ones of different size in different cities. This remarkable project won first prize in C CTBOH competition. It is an air cleaning tower, a vertical tube with glass facing south to heat up and get the stack effect. Air can rush vertically, being cleaned by ionizers and filters and is blown out clean at the top and around the tube can be wrapped residential and office accommodation. This is a, a design for Hong Kong 2014, a food tower with vertical farming facing west, residential facing south, and in the middle, a food processing area for cooked food and packaged food, and the lower parts are a multi-level food market and retail center. Vertical farming is really important if we are to reduce food miles and the energy consumption of food delivery. If a building is mixed use, it does become very complex structurally and in circulation. This student project is a good example with cultural retail in the lower floors and above that offices and residential and transport down below in the basement. The idea of mixed use has been around a while but Ken Yang has done more than most to publicize it with this concept of lifting the mixed use district of a city upwards so that bakeries and grocery shops and libraries and even palaces are all combined into one tower. The big problem is always how to get people up there because it is more difficult to use elevators than to browse in the streets. So what are these opportunities? There is actually another lecture on social spaces coming along in this course. 
with higher levels of detail. This is Heiston Place in Hong Kong, a mixed-use high-rise on the main island. Offices above and about 17 stories of retail connecting into transport at the base. This interesting seven tower residential complex has got a large podium with a park and shopping and parking underneath. At the midpoint you have connecting sky bridges which are leisure spaces for the residents only with a running track. At the top is a public park which you can pay a few dollars to go up to. This does seem quite anomalous being right next to traditional Singapore shop houses but you have to remember this is Singapore anything is possible and it is better that those shop houses are preserved as heritage than knocked down for yet another high-rise development. These are some pictures at the upper levels but notice the residents only levels tend to be rather empty they're not used as much as they should be. At the upper level these are visited because the views from the top are quite spectacular. This is a group of three towers by Moshe Safdie with a huge leisure park at the upper level. I sure would like to swim in there but I probably cannot afford to. Other buildings in Singapore, the Interlace, which is a complex of, sort of rearranged dislocated boxes, but every rooftop is used as either gardening or roof leisure spaces. Sliced porosity connects buildings and makes use of every surface for landscaping. The Newton Suites by Woher incorporate balconies for every resident but also green public spaces at frequent intervals of the building. Park Royal is an expensive hotel but look at the quality of the lush landscaping at different levels. Sky bridges are a historic idea not often carried out because of the difficulty of coordinating different clients on different sites and different time periods but there has always been a desire to try it out. This conceptual idea by our students in 2010 was where we had seven groups of students each doing their own tower but one group was designed was told to coordinate between them designed sky bridges between the blocks coordinating the altitudes where they joined in and also designing a different level of intensity of use of the bridges some of which are containing retail and leisure parks others of which are longer span and simply a way of getting across the same students also designed the underground ground scraper which connected the towers. This is the diagram of their final project. In some ways trying to get the public to find easy ways to get up with green ramps. This is a project in 2016 by three Indonesian students in London next to Blackfrost Bridge where they have sky bridges, a micro university, vertical food farming, retail, parking, cultural centre, photovoltaics, natural ventilation, every idea you can think of somehow they have worked into it. Finally something about transport. Some ideas from the past of how the future might be. 
with combinations of underground, the ground, sky, sky bridges at different levels, and the futurists themselves associated transport with tall buildings. But unfortunately, those architects died on the battlefront of the First World War. This is a drawing by Frank Lloyd Wright of Broad, Broadacre City. So although this is an extremely low-rise, widespread vision, which was quite impractical for eating up the land, he still saw it as necessary to have big city nodes with very tall buildings in them at certain points connected by freeways. Here are some more fantastic visions of futurist ideas combining transport with tall buildings. You just cannot separate urban transport from tall buildings. If you try to service them with vehicles, you will get impossible congestion of the sort that you see on some of these images. It's essential to have a well-tuned metro system. This is a, a random aerial photograph from Tulsa, which I have been to, where you have tall buildings, but anomalously they are surrounded by horizontal car parks and therefore don't meet good criteria for density. They are simply a waste of land and create impossible walking distances between buildings, especially in the summer heat. Everything is wrong with this. You've got China, which 30 years ago had no private motor cars, becoming so keen on the car that they've created horrors like this. Although, of course, the Chinese are still doing good things with public transport, they don't seem to be doing it in their, in their capital city. This is somewhere in Beijing. I don't know how motorists can tolerate this kind of overcrowding every day on their way to work. These pictures are a mixture of pictures of Mumbai and Hong Kong, showing how cities just have to have a metro system and may even employ sky bridges for connections between buildings to avoid walking at the, the dangerous ground level. This picture from Hong Kong is from a book called Cities Without Ground, which has tried to create three-dimensional diagrams of the routes connecting subways, the ground plane, buildings and skywalks. This one in particular in Mong Kok is of Langham Place where the retail goes up and up and up using escalators and panoramic elevators. Really, if you give in to the motor car, you do nothing more than get more motor cars, which means you have to give in again. And transport, especially by motor car, is one of the great providers of greenhouse gas emissions. Shanghai has a plan for expanding its metro network. The current situation is on the bottom left and the proposal for expansion of the metro system is shown on the right. This is London which has a culture of underground systems dating from the mid 19th century but in recent times this is highly important for the urban planning decisions about tall building location, that you get clusters of tall buildings around the bank, around London Bridge, Paddington, Elevened Castle, 
and Canary Wharf and in the long term Lee Mouth so that people can get to those destinations in good quantity and you can leave the historic centres unpolluted by traffic. This is the Shanghai Declaration to make the city better and cleaner and friendlier for pedestrians. And actually, Nottingham has a similar declaration. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I'm sorry if it was too long. Thank you for listening.